a short um, passage from John Owen, and I'll use that to, I'll, I'll read that, um, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get going. Um, John Owen, he's an old dead guy, <laughs> writing here, what's that? He was an old guy. Yeah. <laughs> And um, he writes here about uh, putting, putting sin to death. If, and a passage he's writing from is Romans 8.13, which we'll get to today, I hope. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He writes, the Holy Spirit is our only sufficiency for the work of mortification. He is the only great power behind it, and he works in us as he pleases. God promised His Spirit for this very work. He alone works in and upon believers. He takes away the stony heart, the stubborn, proud, rebellious, and unbelieving heart. Mortification is one of the blessings we have in Christ and is given us by His, His Spirit. In His strength, we can be mortified. Well, how does the Spirit mortify us? One, by causing our hearts to abound in grace and the fruits that are contrary to the works of the flesh. Paul teaches that the fruits of the Spirit are contrary to the works of the flesh. <coughs> Galatians 5, 19 through 21, which we will review today. By the effective destruction of the root and habit of sin to weaken, destroy, and take it away. He takes away the stony heart by an almighty work. He begins this work as to its kind and then carries it on by degrees. He is the fire that burns up the very root of lust. And three, he brings the cross of Christ into the heart of a sinner by faith and gives us communion with Christ in his death and sufferings. The Holy Spirit works mortification in us, yet he keeps it still an act of our own obedience. The Holy Spirit works in us and upon us as we are fit to be wrought in and upon. That is, so as to preserve our own liberty and free obedience. He works upon our understandings, wills, consciences, and affections agreeably to their own natures. He works in us and with us, not against us or without us so that his assistance is an encouragement as to the facilitating of the work. Those who seek to keep down sin without the aid of the Spirit labor in vain. They will combat without victory, wage war without peace, and are slaves all their days. Let me pray. Our great God Almighty, our Father in heaven, creator of heaven and earth and all that are in them, we are gathered together today on this Sabbath day to read of your word and in your word and pray that you would be amongst us with the power of your Holy Spirit that you've promised to us, that is in us as Christians. You have promised and you have done it that your very Holy Spirit indwells us. And we pray, Father, to, to have a sense and a real, a real sense and awareness and joy in its power in this short time we have here in adult Bible study and surely as we are inflamed by the Holy Spirit in holy worship in just a short time. Father, we look forward to it and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I get going, um, Mary Ann gave me this book last week. It's a little book, How to Handle Trouble by an author, his name is Jay Adams. Um, he was a pastor, counselor, started a movement called Methodic Counseling, and now that's got a different term now. But he got that going. This book is great uh, as, a, as an encouragement and a teacher about what to do, how to handle things when you're in trouble. Could be trouble that comes upon you, could be trouble that is because you sin, but you're in trouble. Something's going on in your life. We all know what trouble means. Something's going on. And he teaches in here, as we've learned, that God is always in it. And that's what he teaches you. To look, what is God doing in your life? And how to do that 
And uh, what's going on? I feel so constrained now. <laughs> Get this book. You should if you need it. How to Handle Trouble. Jay Adams, come and see me. I can get it for you. Um, I, found, I found copies on Amazon. It was very easy to do. I just typed in the title, How to Handle Trouble, Jay Adams. Is that the same guy who writes the Dilbert script? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say with 100% certainty, but seeing how Jay Adams is dead, <laughs> he passed away and went to the Lord not too long ago. Uh, I believe, I hope, I mean, I know, I don't know what to say now, but uh, I believe he's passed away. Um, there you go. Get this book. You may find it helpful in your walk. So, our picking up today, our title of today's lesson is our battle, our battle for holiness. And um, the last two weeks we've kind of set the stage, uh, uh, laid the foundation for how um, our, this, that uh, quite a bit of our suffering in this earth, on this earth, in this world, is uh, as a part of our sanctification, our, our march towards holiness. It is something the Christian should expect. Certainly, trouble comes into our life from external to us, car accident, God's in that, death of a loved one, we become sad for some reason or another, we become anxious, we live in a fallen world, and things happen in our world. But quite often, I speak from experience, quite often, what's going on in our life is that God is working on us to perfect us and conform us to the image of Christ. He is pointing out what's going on in our life and saying, this needs to be cleaned up. Uh, last week, and you can begin turning your Bibles first to uh, Galatians 2.20 and to Galatians 5.16-26. You can go ahead and turn to those and they're close by. You find one and the other is just a page away. Last week I pointed out that holiness is all of grace. And that some stop there and say, my march towards holiness, my battle with holiness, for holiness, obedience, it's all of grace, Rick. Let go, let God. And stand still and wait to be conformed to Christ. And uh, if they sin, when they sin, well, God has enabled me to be victorious. I, I'm, I'm powerless. Or some some quibbling of some nature about what's going on. They, they kind of, and I think it was Nick who pointed out, they just kind of stand there. Imagine standing there waiting on God to do it for them. Okay? But I emphasize more than once that it is always by grace our whole life, our, the whole of our life is by grace. Uh, I want to emphasize uh, that any resemblance we may have personally or that, you, that, that we see in Mary, that we see in any one of our Christian brothers and sisters, any, any resemblance to Christ that we see that manifests in our life, or your own life, or our life, any resemblance to Christ, any Christ-like behaviors that manifest in our lives are purely and only by grace and for no other reason. It's because of Christ and no other reason. Galatians 2.20. Who's got their finger there? This may be a memory verse. It's a favorite verse of mine. Somebody got that? I have. Please. Crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. who loved me and gave himself for me. Is there... I mean, there's some there's so many passages we can grab hold of hope and assurance of our lives as Christians, and that is a fine example of many, many, many. That is a wonderful passage of who we are as Christians. We are, we have been crucified with Christ. It it is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you, who lives in me. 
And the life I live right now, right here, this moment, this moment, the, the life that you live right now, you live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave His life. That is a fact. It's a foregone conclusion. We live by grace. We live by faith. Then Galatians 5, 16 through 26. Read, I, I'm going to read that one. Follow along with me. Galatians 5, 16 through 26. Um, ready? But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And I'll stop there. You kind of get the tension there. There's two things going on. Two, two forces that are opposed to each other. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. And I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, flashback to 220, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Amen. Let's pull this apart a little bit and see what we can get out of it. Notice in this passage the link between walking in the Spirit and what comes out of walking in the Spirit. If one walks by the Spirit, 5.16, but I say walk by the Spirit, is that an option? Is that a day? Can I just pick when I do that? But I say walk by the Spirit. Is there any qualifier there for the Christian? Can the Christian walk any other way? No, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What comes out of that? If we walk by the Spirit, what, does, what is, may we expect to grow out of that? Verse 22, what comes out of that? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. A clear link right there, eh? If I walk by the Spirit, I should expect to see on some, some spectrum, some degree, some, some sense, some evidence of these fruits. Should I not say it? True? Am I on track, Sam? Good. Well, what are outbursts? This thing about outbursts of anger. Ooh. Yeah, I, I go nuts with don't get ahead of me, Sam. I'll scream. The cat will look at me like this. She thinks she did something wrong. You know, something wrong. I can't pick something up, and it's, I lose it. Thanks for keeping it real, Sam. Because we all, can, we all here, as Christians, said, ooh, I do that. On some degree or another, think of it all as a spectrum. I know none of us here were at orgies, but in some spectrum here, some level, we all went, ouch. Did we not? I got some of that in me, Paul. Paul's talking to every one of us here. All right, so there's the link. If I walk by the Spirit, I should expect to see this fruit. You should expect to see something, some evidence of this fruit in your life. Let's look at the other one. The desires of the flesh, right there in verse 16. If we fail to walk in the Spirit, what may we expect to see evidence of? Huh? The list is there. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, so on and so on. If we fail to walk... The... Well, Rick, wait a minute. You just said, ouch. Let's draw this out a little bit. 
5.24 And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The Christian may sin. And the evidence where we go, ouch, but what are we walking in the Spirit? We are no longer, uh, someone can look up Romans 6.6 6 for me. We are no longer in the dominion of enslaved to sin. We have another master. And there's a transition going on. Romans 6.6. 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be displayed to sin. There's been a change of masters here. As Christians, our original and natural desire is to only sin. But now that we have been crucified with Christ, now that we live by faith in the Son of God, we have a new master. We are slaves to who? Is it 17? Verse 17? 617? A little head there. Mm -hmm. We got right. 617? Yeah, would someone read that please? We are no longer slaves to sin. Slaves to righteousness. We, are, we have been crucified. That, that desire, that passion to sin has been crucified. There may be vestiges. There may be some coal, some little flame of sin left. But we have a new master. The old man has been put to death. We are able to not sin. Make sense? My loss. It does. Rick, I didn't make a comment. Would you please? But, uh, I'm trying not to move here. I look at it as um, love being the first thing mentioned, that everything else flows out of love. I mean, it goes back to you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm -hmm. If that's all we had and that's all we did, that's enough. Even Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if you love the Lord, you're going to love your neighbor. As yourself, because that is what he would have you do. You are I would agree with you. Going to obey. If all we were to do is love, other fruits would become evident and grow. Not like fluffy John Lennon, all you need is love. We, we know you're making sure. Know. If all we do is love our neighbor, love the Lord our God with all our strength, my soul, and love our neighbor as ourself, you're saying other, other fruit would become evident, right? Absolutely. Yes. And we should expect that. Even though we, we sense, ouch, I know I'm out of step, and we're going to get to that, we are slaves to righteousness. We have been crucified with Christ. We have. Only the Christian can say that. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, which has been killed, crucified, with, with is this key, the key word there, its passions and desires. We will desire to not sin more Christians should desire to not sin. Uh, 525, if we live by the Spirit, Galatians 525, if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The Christian, you guys, you guys, the Christian walks by the Spirit. The Christian must keep in step with the Spirit. The Christian will want to keep in step with the Spirit. So as to yield the fruit of the Spirit described in verse 22, the Holy Spirit will well up in us, enable us, cause us, more on this in a minute, to desire these fruit in our lives. And all of this is of grace and only made possible by Christ. Life on earth, His death by crucifixion, His resurrection, His ascension into heaven, and the work He does on our behalf in heaven right now. Belonging to Christ as we do, our birthright is that we are now slaves to righteousness and we are now expected to be good slaves to righteousness. 
to do the things that a slave to righteousness, a slave, a slave to Christ would do. We want to be good kids. We're going to do what we're supposed to do. We should desire it. We live as slaves and are expected to be obedient to our master. And that theme kind of comes up in Paul's letters and others. This is all of grace, though. It is every bit of grace. This birthright, birthright, this new attitude, this desire to be obedient children is not natural. It is only of grace that we are that way. Romans 6, let's go there. Romans 6, we're going to drive this in like hammering a nail into a board. Romans 6, 11 through 18. Follow along with me as I read. Please, give you a moment to get there. Romans 6, verse 11 through 18. You there? Here we go. So you also must consider yourselves. There's a command there. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will, no, will have no dominion since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or, dis or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Notice the fact. There's, it's not as if you decide which fruit am I going to grow, what, what is expected of me. It's decided here for you. You live, I live in a state of grace. We are slaves of righteousness. And we shall, if we are Christians, we shall slowly, by steps, yield this fruit that the Christian yields. Not all at once. Well, maybe in the, maybe in the case of Eve, yeah, all at once. No, it, it, by degrees and by steps, we change and are conformed to the image of Christ over the course of our walk with Christ. But we must walk. I want you to notice the fact, the foregone conclusion that you are dead to sin and alive to God and you are a slave of righteousness. We walk in the Spirit. It's all of grace. But we walk. We move along. We do things. It's all a fact. It's who we are. <clears throat> a fruit, a fruit of the grace that we enjoy by belonging to Christ is that we may be obedient from the heart, 617. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become, you have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Not maybe, not we shall see, but you have become. This is who we are. This is who you are. We need to get that frame of mind. There is no, maybe I'll join in this battle for holiness. You are in the battle for holiness. This is what we do. Get it? Okay. And it's all grace that we can go on. Prior to being crucified with Christ, the old natural self was in no way able to be obedient to Christ from the heart. Because they were, you were dead. Dead is dead. Now you may be obedient from the heart of Christ. A change. We are able to do it. We are expected to do it. You shall do it. Okay, Rick, fine. What does this mean in practical terms? Philippians 4. Familiar passage here in Philippians 4, beginning in verse 11. 
maybe a favorite memory verse of yours. Allow me to read it. Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. Shall I? Shall I go here? Rebecca, you ready? What, what, what am I waiting on? Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen? Very familiar passage, one that I'm sure has helped us all in times of trouble. Let's pick this apart just for a minute. How is the Christian to live in all situations? In every, each and every situation in our life? How are we to live? Content. With content, thank you. We are uh, able now, we were not able before, but we are able now to live in content. We may experience times of discontent. I'm not saying that life is always peachy, good, creamy, and rich. I know better. I know I am a Christian, and I know I have lived in times where I am discontent. But I am able to live in content. And I must strive to get there, right? I am able to be content. How I react to situations and circumstances of my life. I've got to go to school. I've got to go to work. I don't want to go there. I've got to do this. I'm sick. I'm, I'm whatever is going on. The situations and circumstances we find ourselves in our life, they're uncomfortable. They're stressful. But we are able now as a Christian to live in the midst of that contently. True? It says it. I am alive now. Prior, in my old state, I could not do it. I may act happy, but inside, I am a mess. I cannot do it. I may get there, but it doesn't glorify God when I do. But now I can live contently, all to the glory of God. My reactions and behaviors now are only because I am able to walk with Christ. Because I walk in the Spirit. Because I've crucified the flesh. Because I have faith in God who died, died for me. All those promises, all those things that are facts, I can live contently. <clears throat> Holiness then, here's what I want us to grasp in this lesson. One of the key points. Holiness then is not a list of do's and don'ts where we're constantly checking boxes or getting the eraser out and unchecking a box because there I go again. Holiness is not a list, a checklist of do's and don'ts. But it is an active conforming to Christ's image. Obedience to God's will in our life in all circumstances with contempt. Notice it's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's an attitude. It's a desire to live a life in obedience to God's will for my life and to be contented in it. Does that sound like that's going to be a bit of a battle? I'm going to have to remind myself who I am. I'm going to have to say, Rick, put on your big boy britches and get in the game and get in the fight. Pray. More on that later. Get in the fight and seek after contentment. But Lord, I don't feel content. I am worked up here. I am scared. S Spirit, please do your work. Right? Spirit, do your work. Pray for it. Colossians 1, 9 through 11. Where does this power come from, Rick? Rick, what are you talking about? Where does this power come to have this attitude, to be contented, to strive after it, to join the battle, where does it come from? Colossians 1, verses 9 through 11. Where am I at? There we go. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you 
asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. What's he saying here? So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There it is. Walking in. Pray and walk. That's where the strength comes from. Is it something I earn a merit badge and I'm good now? Is it something I am doing? What am I doing there? Who am I relying on? Who are we relying on? The Lord. The Lord and His Holy Spirit to do its work in my life. Praying for my knowledge and understanding of Christ to abound. Praying, Holy Spirit, move me out of the way and work in me so I can become contented. Because I'm not. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. The result? Some of this comes easy. Some of this comes hard. Some of us have a walk that is uphill a lot. Some of us get to walk on level ground. Some of us get to, it's all downhill and easy. You know? It's different for each of us. But it ends in the same place. It goes. In this walk, in this striving, as we pray for the Spirit to do its work in our life, we get hope out of hopelessness. We get encouragement out of despair and sadness. We get the ability to forgive when angered. We get peace out of anxiety. That's the slave to righteousness gets those things. The slave to sin and death sulks continually and always about the future. I don't get what I want. It's all about me and I'm not getting what I want. They are bitter in their sadness. Always bitter. Not seeking to come out of that. Always bitter. Actually liking to be bitter, I've noticed. Gives them a right to be angry. This is certain. They become bitter in their sadness. The slave to sin and death becomes vengeful in their anger. They live in fear. But not so for us. Hope out of hopelessness. Encouragement from despair and sadness. Ability to forgive. Peace. That's not to say that sometimes we don't sulk. That sometimes we don't become bitter. I know we do. I know I do. Sometimes I think, boy, I'd just like to get that guy who cut me off. I know we do. And what's that feel like for the Christian when we do that? Does it feel good? You know, at some point we go, oh, that's not good, Rick. Right? When we let go of the promises and resort to what seemed to work in the past, I know what to do. I read this in a book somewhere. When we, we, when we rely on our own resources to get out of these, this trouble or the latest remedy that we read somewhere or heard somewhere, that's when we get in trouble. To dwell upon our own resources to gain favor with God is sin, as we, we would all say. To look to Christ and His Spirit within us is conforming to Christ in the beginning of holiness. When we look inside, when we close up and go, I don't feel well, this upsets me, or I see this thing going on in my life, and I, I recognize it is not good, but I'm not going to deal with it. When we close in, or we try to do it in our own power, I'll just be good today, I'll zip it and keep quiet at work, or whatever. When we just do those things, do those things, but if, when we look to Christ and His Spirit within us, seeking to be conformed to Christ in that situation, there is the beginning of holiness in our life. Uh, the beginning is, is focusing on the reality that we read about in Romans chapter 6, 11 through 18. And that change that has happened in our life, that change in our heart, and the ability to be obedient from the heart. That's the beginning of holiness in our life. 
That's the beginning of the trek towards holiness. The journey towards holiness. We may unfortunately sin, but sin no longer reigns in our life because we are united to Christ. Realize, take hold of that reality, be thankful for it. We are united to Christ. We may sin, we will grieve over it, we will seek to do something about it, I hope. But we are always united to Christ. Uh, real quick, the change agent in our life, uh, to begin to foot stop this, what makes us able to um, enjoy, to join the battle for holiness, to uh, grieve about our sin, what, what causes all this to happen in our life is because of our union with Christ. I think we've dwelt on that hopefully a lot. Galatians 5. Galatians 2.20, all those, because of the reality of who we were joined to, we may be obedient. It's the Holy Spirit that is working in us. The Holy Spirit works in us so that we may decide and act according to God's purpose where we never could do that prior to our being saved. We were dead prior. Now we are alive to God. It is grace that we are united to Christ. It is grace that the Holy Spirit indwells us to urge us on and give us an ability to not sin. Let's skip ahead here to James chapter 1, verse 22. Running out of time. Always running out of time. James 1, 22. Familiar verse? Let's give a sense of how do I do this? Rick, what am I? It's not, a, it's not do's and don'ts. Then what is this in practical terms? And how do I do it? James 1, verse 22. But the doers of the word and not hearers only. What's it say there? Deceiving yourselves. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Sometimes in this striving and our desire to become holy, to live up to our potential in Christ, we depend only upon our piety, our reading of the Word, our praying, our I get to church every Sunday, I do these things that I'm supposed to do. I'm doing things, and they're good and of themselves. They're good. But we depend upon these means of grace. Rick, is it, uh, I think maybe Martin Luther is credited with saying, I'd rather see a, uh, see a sermon than hear one. Oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Where's that go? say whatever, but it's, mm -hmm. it's walking the walk. It's, really... it's walking the walk, yes. Yeah, it's, it's thinking about our, our, our senses there, seeing it. Helps. Yeah, okay. We believe our piety and attending to the means of grace are all we need to do to be holy, to be a hearer only. We go to church, we hear a sermon, or we read a passage, and we'll go, I need to do that. That's a good idea. I need to do that. A hearer only. We read, we then we then what happens? We we start a good hand, we start something, and we stop. Or never start, or just drop it all together. These are things I can. These are things I've done. I know we all have. And in that, in being a hearer only, we deceive ourselves. We and, and really, what we're doing, we're underestimating the power of the Holy Spirit that is in us. We think it's us. We need to be doers. We need to strive after that. Um, because when we underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit, when we think, "Well, I got to do this." I, that's a good idea. Let me go and we get busy. We can get up, we can get up in a bad place. Look at David. Apple of the Lord, the Lord's eye, right? He kind of thought, well, I'm good here. I got this. Revelations 3.17, real quick. I think I can get there. Revelations. I want us to realize we what we have to rely upon. Revelations 3, or, or what the danger would be. Revelations 3, 17. 
For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. That's looking in at ourself. We need to look to Christ. We need to be doers because of He who works in us. So we must join the battle. Flip back to Philippians 2.13. I'm going quick. I'm sorry. It's my bad. Philippians 2.13. <clears throat> for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Before we can act, He must will it into our life. The Holy Spirit builds within each of us the desire, I'll say the will, for holiness. You with me here? I'm moving quick. This is important. The Holy Spirit builds within us the desire for holiness by showing us our sinfulness. You know, it is a great thing, a great act of faith. I, I, I Ask in your prayers, ask God to show you where you sin. You think you know where you sin. Ask God to show it to you. Father, show me my sin. Where is it at? The Holy Spirit builds within us the desire for holiness by showing us our sinfulness and building up within us like a fire within us a desire to kill that sin. There's the action. God builds within us the will, which is all of grace. It's always of grace. Being as we are Christian, the Holy Spirit will generate within me, the Holy Spirit will generate within you a loathing for the sin. If not, if you say, well, that sin's small enough, it doesn't matter. Or I need that. I desire that. But I like it. I want it. If the Holy Spirit shows you that is sin, then I would say to you, Christian, with fear and trembling, work out your salvation. Pray that you would come to hate that sin. As the Holy Spirit builds within us a loathing for the sin within us, we begin to desire that which is holy, righteous, and good. I'd reference you to Romans 7.12. We will move on. I kind of summarize that passage there. But as the Holy Spirit builds within us that loathing for sin that we need, to, we desire, that we need, Lord, show me where I sin, that I may kill it. We begin to desire that which is holy, righteous, and good. If we fail, and we desire it all the more and delight in it, um, oh, pardon me, I have a mistake there. We fail, and we desire it all the more and delight in it. We are acting. Uh, we are acting. God builds within us the will to kill sin so that we may act upon it. I think I got a little off track there, but the whole point is God builds in us the will to mortify the sin that is in our life so that we may act. We don't act in our own power. No, no, no. We do act though, but it's all by grace. We join the battle. Um... How do we do this, Rick? Again, what do we do? Well, I tell you um, a steady intake of Scripture in your prayer life, a steady act, daily reading of Scripture fortifies you and makes you strong and able, pliable, willing to look, Lord, what do I need to work on in my life? And then we must Pray for holiness. Ephesians 3.16, Colossians 1, 9 through 10, we read that. Pray that we would we'd be filled up with the knowledge of Christ so that we could walk by the Spirit. Dottie, think it was on, tra on track? Okay. I'm going to wrap this up here with something else from John Owen to send us on our way. From Psalm 32, 3. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. As we walk with our God, we desire strength, comfort, power, and peace. The realization of these, and thus the joy of our spiritual life, depends 
greatly upon the mortification of sin. The immediate cause of these privileges is our adoption at the hand of the Holy Spirit. However, in our ordinary walking with God, the vigor and comfort of our spiritual lives depends much on our mortification, our killing of sin in our life. Mortification bears a cause and effect relationship to our joy. The vigor of our spiritual lives is not possible apart from mortification. Mortification keeps sin from depriving us of our healthy spiritual life. Every unmortified sin will certainly do two things. One, it will weaken the soul and deprive it of its vigor. When David had for a while harbored lust in his heart, it broke his bones and left him no spiritual strength. An unmortified lust will drink up the spirit and all the vigor of the soul and weaken it for all duties. Sin untunes the heart by entangling its affections. It diverts the heart from the spiritual frame that is required for communion with God. Sin fills the thoughts with its enticements. It captures, it captures the thoughts and if unmortified, it seeks to make provision to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Sin breaks out and hinders duty. Two, sin will darken the soul. Depressed, sad, angry. Sin will darken the soul and deprive it of its comfort and peace. Sin is a cloud that spreads itself over the face of the soul and intercepts the beams of God's love and favor. It takes away all the sense of its privileges of our adoption. If the soul begins to gather up thoughts of cons consolation, sin quickly scatters them. But now, let the heart be cleansed by mortification, and let the weeds of lust be daily rooted up, and there will be room for grace to thrive.